Okay, so uh, my name is Chagai Matar. I'm an Israeli journalist, uh, 33, from Tel Aviv. I've been coming to these protests for 12 years now, and uh, now we're commemorating 12 years of struggle here in Berlin. Mm. The North American audience should know that there are many Israelis who come here in solidarity to demonstrate with the Palestinians, even under fire from the uh, occupying uh, army of Israel. Yeah, indeed. Mm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that many, but we are, I would say, a few hundred, maybe, Israelis that would come not every week, but, you know, uh, fairly regularly to these protests. Uh, with what motivation do they come? On what basis? Um, I think people come out of solidarity, uh, out of a feeling of responsibility for the wall that's being built and the overall occupation and policy of settlement. Uh, as Israelis, we're responsible for that. We're, what the, the state does to people here in Berlin is partly our responsibility. And when the people in Berlin have chosen to invite us to be a part of their struggle, their popular and nonviolent struggle against the wall, um, for people that are opposing the occupation, it was clear that we have to be here. So by opposing the wall, that means, in effect, that these Israelis who come here to demonstrate, like the many here, um, want a uh, common society, or are they uh, thinking of two states? Uh, what is their position? I think if you ask everyone here, I mean, you'll get several very, very different answers. Uh, the organizers of the protest, the Palestinian protest uh, organizers, are mostly, if not all of them, supporters of the two-state solution. Uh, amongst the Israeli protesters, some would support one state and some two. But I think the, the basic concept is that whatever the choice, the occupation has to end, and even more importantly, when it ends, the thought is that even within a two-state solution, it's not a separation that ends any connection, but it's the beginning of, of new connections, of new links between the societies. And what we're trying to do is tear down the wall, both, both physically and uh, metaphorically. Uh, and psychologically. And psychologically, exactly. To tell, yeah. to tell Israelis this has been a very important place, Berlin specifically, a very important place for Israelis to be able to tell other Israelis, come and see the Palestinian side. You are welcomed here. You, you can see Palestinians that want you as their partner, both in struggle now, but also in the long-term thinking of what this land should look like. Um, and so this has been a place for, for a political education for many people. Uh, that would come here, for example, as, as youth. I, I know quite a lot of people that came here when they were teenagers and then decided to refuse going to the army because they created this bond here and could not after that go to the army. Mm -hmm. yes. We read uh, in North America some news reports, not in the main media, of course, but there's uh, some young women now who are going to prison because they refused the draft. Mm -hmm. And right, also no, the, uh, Hasidim, the Hasidim are demonstrating. Mm -hmm. They were fighting with the police in the street, I saw. Uh, against uh, one of the uh, to protect one of the draft dodgers. Yeah, recently. yeah. Yes. Uh, they, for quite different reasons. I mean, for them, they just—they're not saying that the occupation should end. Some of them do, but the majority are just saying that the draft should not be imposed on the ultra orthodox and the Haredim. Uh, but but yeah, we do have three conscientious objectors, um, all of them women, now in prison yeah. for refusing the draft, and uh, there's a lot of support them back, back, back in Tel Aviv. Uh, Hasidim must be following the same thing as my father. He was a religious pacifist. He was orthodox. Mm -hmm. I was raised orthodox myself. Uh, right. But uh, that's that tradition. Yes, very good. But they're, not, but they're not necessarily pacifists. I mean, they would support the army's activities. Many of them would support the army's activities and occupation. They just don't think that they themselves should be part of it. Uh, yes. Not for being pacifists, just because uh, they're destination is to, to study, to learn Torah and, and do that and not be, and others should go to fight. I mean, so there's... Uh, uh, what, that's what's the breakdown? What percentage would you say uh, uh, are complacent about the military's activities and, and what percentage are opposed to it in principle as pacifists? Like in the... In the um, Amongst the Hasidim. Among the Hasidim? Mm, it's hard to say. I mean, there, I don't think there have been any polls uh, on the matter. I would say 10 to 20 percent are opposed to government and army policies as a whole. Uh -huh. uh, some out of more pacifism and some more politically because they think we shouldn't, there's an old Jewish tradition of not um, not fighting with your neighbors, yes. understanding that you shouldn't try to provoke people around you. And even as rulers, we shouldn't be provoking the people that we live with 
because that's not the, the Jewish way, not necessarily out of pacifism, just out of mm. a different concept of what Judaism is about. But I think that's the minority. The latest poll that I saw on the breakdown of political opinion amongst the Israelis mm -hmm. is that 44% are opposed to the occupation, 48% support the occupation. That was before before Trump and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that that's an accurate uh, assessment? And uh, what's the volatility of it? Can, how can it change? There are, there are different polls coming out all the, all the time. There was another one that came out just the other week, a uh, week ago or so, uh, saying that 52% of Israelis still support the two-state solution. Uh, I mean, so that you, you get different polls. Most of them range around that area of between 40 and 60% uh, support uh, peace agreement with the states and so on. I think the problem is that the majority of Israelis, these questions are usually framed very generally, and the problem is that the majority of Israelis, when you ask them not about like a general notion of solution, but uh, actual steps to be taken, the majority would in the end support the status quo. And that's Netanyahu's policy. Uh, that's what he said with Trump just earlier this week. He said, I don't support a two-state solution because then we'd have a terrorist state. I don't support annexing the territories and giving people citizenship because that would be the end of the Jewish state. So we just have to live with the status quo, and I think that's what the majority support. Mm. Uh, that latter position was exactly what President Rivlin called for. He called for, in effect, annexation with giving you know citizenship rights mm -hmm. to the Palestinians, yeah. which is rather unusual for a Likudnik. It's, it's quite unusual for, for anyone uh, outside of the radical left. There's a lot of people in the radical right uh, the settler right that would support annexation but without full citizenship to Palestinians. Yeah. So Rivlin's policy of, of supporting full annexation and full citizenship uh, is quite rare. Uh, even though I think he too does not consider the Gaza Strip to be part of the equation. I think uh, it makes it easier for him demographically to think we're not talking about that area, it's just about the West Bank. And he's certainly not talking about the refugees outside And he's definitely not, not talking about the refugees. So, yes. I mean, I think in a sense you can say that there's something more progressive about it because he, he says anyone that is under Israeli rule should have complete and full equal rights, mm -hmm. which is, you know, something you don't get a lot of yeah. in Israeli politics. Yes. Uh, but even that has its downsides as, as we just said. So. Thank you for an excellent interview. Sure, happy to help. Okay.